Today is Nicky's first day at school. He's four years old. What will he be getting at this vital stage in his life? And is it the best we can offer our children? Nicky is still under statutory school age, but then so are over 60% of the children starting primary school. Are primary schools equipped to deal with the needs of children under five? First impressions are not all that favorable. My first impression when I walked in the door was that there was a lot of children there and it was very noisy. I was a little bit worried then. I didn't know whether he would actually settle down and would start learning. Where do you want to put your pee bag? We've got a peg here with your name on it for you. Shall we find it? Shall we see if we can find your name? And you'll have a peg there to hang your coat and your pink bag. Oh, it's one of the pink ones. Can you find your name? Can you see your name? One of the pink ones. The first problem is the sheer number involved. In this school, 100 children share an open plan classroom area with only three teachers and two nursery nurses working as a team. Two standard size reception classes have been merged with a nursery class, so five-year-olds mix with three-year-olds. It's a melting pot of different ages and abilities, and the noise level at times is incredibly high. Put a bit more further along then, eh? My, this is fun. I think it's what used to be called organised chaos. I'm not trying to suggest to you that the atmosphere in this classroom is ever fraught or tense, but I have just heard that even the class guinea pigs just had a stroke. What is going on here? Have you any idea, Helen? In this area of South London, children can start school in classes of up to 35. Here at Hatfield Primary School in Merton, they're trying to use resources as efficiently as they can and help children like Nikki settle in. Nursery and reception class teachers have combined their skills to create an early years unit. In theory, it means that children can progress at their own pace, but the initial impression is one of chaos. Luciana, you have a tremendous mix of children in, in this setup of yours. Um, you have all sorts of varied ability, varied backgrounds, um, different uh, experiences they've all had. How do you help them all to learn? Children are naturally drawn together uh, according to their particular abilities. And even though it's a three-year-old or a five-year-old, their maturity may be the same, so they can come together for certain activities anyway. The children that we get in the unit have had very varying backgrounds before coming into the reception class. Some children have come from our own nursery section. Some children have come from play groups or nursery schools from other parts of the borough. Some children are direct entry children and they haven't necessarily had any preschool experience at all. So educational experience has already become unequal for young children by the time they get to the official school age. Nikki, like one in three children under five, has been to a registered playgroup. In an ideal world, teachers would be building on a child's previous learning experiences. But in practice, there is very little chance to make contact. The teachers here, however, do make an effort to talk to local nurseries, playgroups, and above all to parents to find out about children's interests and previous ways of learning. They not only have to assess a new child's present level of knowledge, but also get an idea of what they might be capable of in the future. The message coming from long-standing research says it's vital that teachers have high expectations of all children. But with such a wide range of children in front of them, it's often too easy for teachers to settle for some middle-of-the-road level of achievement. There is an increasing demand from many parents that their children should start school as early as possible. But educationalists say it's dangerous to assume that early entry to primary school gives a child a good start 
unless the appropriate resources and skilled staff are available. Parents, on the other hand, are concerned that their children should be stretched, particularly in the areas of reading and writing. Luciana, yes. how on earth do you manage to try and get some learning done in, in this sort of bedlam that we've got around us? It may look as if it's bedlam, but I assure you it is organised, and we do have every activity that's set up has been thought about, and it's there for a reason. Uh, this afternoon, most of the activities that are around are connected with our topic and there are number activities, there are writing activities, there are reading activities going on, some of which there's an adult with them working with the children, some where the children are expected to go and get on with it themselves. Can you put your name on it, Faye? No, it's Sian's turn now, isn't it? In the children's first few days at school, they're introduced to a lot of activities that they will view as games, but they are structured activities that we can start assessing the children's mathematical concepts. Now it's Nicky's turn again. Oh, no. Later on in the year, Nicky will be able to cope with more complicated mathematical games, such as these children are doing here. I hope I'm going to get one. And what does yours say? Two add on two. And what's two add on two? Four. Four. Have you got a number four? Yes. When the children are throwing the dice, what I want them to do is to retain the number that's written and then add on the number of what dots. What does yours say, Mark? One and six. One and six, which is how many altogether? I've only got two more and then I've finished. Seven. Seven. Have you got a seven there? No. No, you haven't. So you're going to pass the dice on to Charlene then? The beginnings of children's mathematics starts with grouping things together, and we call these sets. The children are being asked to devise some sort of criteria for setting up their own set. They're of all the same animal or type of transport. There's one there, yes. We've got another one. Are there any more camels? Can you see any more camels? And from us? that, Can you, find any more camels? you bring in the number work as well. You match them up, you've got to join them up. Join the each ball to each part. This is another set activity. The first thing that they're asked to do is to draw the same number of bones as there are dogs. So obviously they have to count the number of dogs and then draw the same number of bones. So it's an exercise in counting and then tallying in order to check that they have counted the right number. Two, three, four, five. I think the parents sometimes wonder what their children are doing when they see them playing with these cards. But what they are trying to do is match the word to the number and the representation. The breakthrough to literacy, or the sentence maker as we call it, is used extensively in the early part of their learning. It's used mainly for their writing. It's an approach which leads them straight into writing sentences. Hi, Mummy and Daddy. What are you doing here, Natalie? Making a sentence. You're doing what? Making a sentence. Very good. What's your sentence say? I can play with my mummy and daddy full stop. Full stop? You're going to put it all back now? Time. If there is an activity where we want the children to be reasonably quiet and to listen well, then we have the quiet rooms that we withdraw them to. This is especially when we're doing reading activities. Put your hand up. Charlene, what do you think it says? You think it says reading? I thought it You've got the right sound at the beginning and you've got the right sound at the end. But what's this riding? All right, put your hand up if you think you can tell me what this word says. All right, Natalie, can you tell me what it says? Car, that's right. Good. Now, if I covered up the sound at the end put a there. and put a T, what would it say instead? Cat. Can Natalie tell me what would it say? Cat. 
who can tell me what this word says. Trevor, what does this train. word say? Train. That's right. How do you know it says train? Because I could see through the paper. <laughs> <laughs> There is obviously some fairly conventional learning going on, but there are also times when an outsider might think the children were doing nothing but playing. What does Luciana think? Yes, and I'd agree with you, but at the same time there's so much that they can be learning through their play, which is far more valuable, learning it through their play, than later on making them sit down and learn it from a textbook or learn it in a very formal, rigid approach. And because we believe in that, we do encourage the children to learn in all the varying activities within the unit, although it's often just seen as play. But play is a learning activity. And you can mix yours up and we'll see what happens. When they're cooking, they're learning all sorts of things. The idea that things have to be measured and weighed and that if they're not, things can go drastically wrong. Let's see if it's still sticking. Particularly in the sand and water, we do a lot of activities with them so that they practice pouring from one container to another. This will later on lead on to capacity work. The children have already started estimating how many cups will fill a jug and, as I say, will all lead on to their capacity work later on. They are learning about materials what things can and can't do. Whoops. Nearly lost her tail then. Most of the children's learning experiences are based on a central theme that we call a topic. Within that, we incorporate all areas of the curriculum so that the children's learning has a purpose. What project work are you doing at the moment? At the moment, we're doing a big topic on holidays because the children are so keen and so enthusiastic. A lot of the children do have their annual holiday during term time. And obviously, at this age, they're, they're full of it when they come back and they send us postcards while they're away. And so the children have had a great interest in the topic. And as you can see, we then draw from it as much as we can in all the curriculum areas. And we're particularly looking forward to sharing all this work we've been doing on our topic with the rest of the school in our assembly. We've all been learning a very happy <coughs> holiday song, which we would like to sing for you. You're one as well, are you? Good. I'd like to go to Spain. I wonder if you could help me. Have you got a brochure? Yes. Uh, I see. We'll go to Turkey instead, then. Um, how much will it cost me? Um, five p. Do you want to come and sit over here? Because you seem to be jolly helpful. Could you come and, and, and join your friend? That'd be good. That's, that's a jolly useful chair. Right, how, how much is it going to cost me to go to Turkey? Two pounds. Two pounds? That's terrifically good value. Um, what's it like in Turkey? Have you been there? Boiling pot. Boiling pot? Yeah. And I can go there for two pounds. You're going to phone up to make my booking? Um, there's someone who wants to go to Turkey. Yes, yes. 
That was very quick. Could you just call back and confirm that my booking is made? Yeah, his booking is made. He seems to be very fast on the other end, doesn't he? How long does two pounds last for me? Two years. Two years for two pounds? That's terrific. I've never been in a travel agent that's offered such good value. Do you take credit cards? The children are supposedly working at their own pace, in their own time. But can so few teachers really keep track of what they are all doing and make sure they're stretched to their full potential? There are sometimes more than 100 children in this room. How do you manage to monitor all their progress? This is the most time-consuming part of our whole day, really, of our week and our term. Uh, we have a lot of different ways of monitoring the children. Initially, we monitor them for each activity that we want them to do during the day. Emily, Emily, would you like to come and do the big chip and cooker activity with me? Shall we go and do it? And we have tick-off lists where we check that the children that need to do that particular activity have come to it during the day. Each morning we meet to organise the daily routine and then at the end of the day we meet in order to review how the day has gone and what we need to do for the following day. So maybe tomorrow we'll go out and collect some things from the park and see if we can do some more classifying into sets using conkers, leaves, seeds, that sort of thing. Did you notice how Andrea was getting on this morning? Well I noticed her flitting about an awful lot and she didn't seem to settle to anything in particular. Uh, but when I called her over to work with me, she came quite happily. But I think she mm. needs a lot more direction. Yes, yes. So if we see her wandering, needing a little bit more direction, that's, we all know, that's what we need to do with Andrea. Yes. I think it is possible for children to slip through the net. I wouldn't think it would be possible for the whole day. There would be parts of the day where children would slip through the net. But... I would imagine they'd be the children that would need that time to relax for a while before going on to another activity. We don't panic or worry about it. We just ensure that it doesn't happen too often and obviously draw them into the activities that they need to do as and when we notice or when they are ready to go on to it. Research into how children learn at this age stresses the importance of the role of parents. And the school recognises this. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for coming to this short but important meeting. And we're glad that you've made time to, to be with us because we consider this meeting a very important one because we see very much our role and yours as one of partnership. Prospective parents are invited to hear the staff explain what the school is trying to do and to encourage them to get involved. Parental involvement has been very much a tradition at this school and we hope that you'll continue that pattern while you're involved all the time that your children are with us. Clearly, parents will have anxieties about a system that might be very different from their own experience of school. Um, why do some children start part-time and some full-time? Why is this? I mean, is it's all it... according to your birthday, I'm afraid. Oh. If you were clever and had your children in the autumn term, and I would encourage all those who are thinking about it to do that. Um, if you've got a child and, uh, uh, whose birthday is between September and December, then they will have, and they're five in that coming term, they'll have three full terms in class one. If their birthday is between January and April, they will come in in September and have mornings only in class one, and then we'll have full-time education after Christmas, because again, it'll be the term in which they're five. You mentioned about concentration skill, which I also believe is very important. How do you manage to achieve this when it's open plan and you have quite a lot of children in the class? If it's an activity that does require a lot of concentration, they are taken as a group that need that particular activity into one of the other rooms. We have three smaller rooms that the children can be withdrawn to, providing we have the adults in order to do that. 
I think people, when they look through the door sometimes, or the window, they think, ah, you know, because they just see such a melee of, of activity and can't always see perhaps the direct purpose behind or centred on each activity. And I think that's another very good reason for perhaps coming in, not necessarily to help, because you'll think I'm trying to get you to come in again, which I am probably, but, uh, but my point in saying that is that the best way to find out what goes on is to come in. And I mean, if you can just come and spend an hour or a morning or an afternoon or whatever, just to come in and see the purpose behind what is going on, I'm sure it will be much better than just looking through the window and... Not necessarily understand but are schools generally doing enough to listen to the parents' concerns? And is their desire for parental involvement really genuine? I think this whole system needs to run on a partnership with the parents. That's why, or one of the reasons why, we encourage them to work in the unit as often as possible. Then, he tried on his... Punch! punch. His, and we encourage and like to have as many dads as mums. And we have a dad at the moment that comes in and helps us. He painted a... a picture. What did he paint a picture of? A cat cat. A cat, that's right. Which cat is it? That, that one. That's right. By the time it had finished, he left the room, it was a full mess, wasn't it? Hoop over your head. That's it. Run to the bench, quickly. Sports Day provides a more informal chance for parents and teachers to get together. Through the barrel. I think Sports Day is a combination of two things. It's partly a fun event for the children and for the parents, and it's partly a means of getting the parents to the school and involved in the activities that we're doing. Very good. Right, next one now. Unpaid help from parents is essential, says the school, to free the few trained staff to do their primary job of teaching. Parents are not just welcome, they're absolutely vital. Pooling staff and resources to create an early years unit like this one is an economical solution to the demand from parents for more places and the problems caused by there being more four-year-olds in school. But supporters of the system see it as educationally valuable too. The point of it is, as I've said, to do with the way that four-year-olds, when they're just put into an ordinary reception class, they do find that very tough to deal with. They're, generally speaking, being asked to cope with formal work that um, behaviourally and emotionally, they're not really ready for it. Some of our schools, for example, <clears throat> will take children when they're rising fives. Some will take them in September or in subsequent terms, whereas if they have a nursery class, then they can just go straight through and there is no sense of disruption or dislocation. We see that as it as an early years provision and it should be a seamless road where children make a good progression from their nursery class into their ordinary education. It obviously requires a lot of effort from the teachers, but does it require a lot of money as well? It is only expensive in terms of teachers' efforts. Um, obviously, the more money you could throw at it would be better, but there's actually no strict correlation between the amount of money and the outputs at the other end. And it's really a matter of attitude more than actual expense. Trip, trap, trip, trap, went the hooves yeah. of the youngest being <laughs> that gruff. The attitude of teachers, then, oh, is all important. The troll's ugly head. He was so ugly that the youngest Billy Goat Gruff nearly fell down with fright. There's no question that teaching in this kind of unit makes enormous demands on the individual and can only work if the staff are committed and can work together as a team. It's only me, the littlest Billy Goat Gruff, he said. I'm going to the meadow to make myself fat. A tremendous amount of energy and effort must go into working with young children. And it's not something where you're just child-minding or you have a mothering instinct and want to be with young children. You really do want to help the children to learn. And you work very hard at doing that, especially if you want them all to develop 
individually and to progress at their own rate. It's a noble thought, but what's the biggest problem it creates? Our biggest problem is dealing with 35 children and in order to ensure that we stretch all those children in all curriculum areas as much as we can, we need fewer children or we need more teachers. It makes me obviously very cross and very angry because it is supposed to be the time when children learn at their best and yet we are not being given the opportunity to do it to our best ability because of the numbers of children we're expected to do it with. We've seen today what hard work it can be, but why does it still excite you? It's really the wish that I'd been taught in this way when I was at school. I feel that it's a waste of children's energies trying to make them sit still and learn something that isn't necessarily appropriate. I, I, I'm terribly excited. Um, I've seen two or three things coming together. My own views about how children learn best, the developing of professionalism with young teachers who are gradually sort of seeing the role in a different way, and the way that we're also able to work with the institutions. Whatever the final verdict on this approach to early years education, there's little doubt about the enthusiasm and dedication at this school. The national picture is less encouraging. Provision of any kind for this age range is patchy. Many teachers don't have specialist training, and others are working in socially deprived areas. In the circumstances, many teachers become cynical and dispirited. Others simply can't cope. Although some head teachers put their strongest staff in the reception classes, society as a whole still greatly undervalues the teaching of young children. Thankfully, the Hatfield School guinea pig recovered from his stroke. And luckily, Luciana still thrives on the atmosphere. It can be wearing, and you do find you're exhausted by the end of the day, but it is the approach we want to take. And because we've all agreed to it, and we're all enthusiastic and keen to ensure that it works, it's not as tiring as it could be, and we enjoy it. It's these early days of education that lay the foundations for the future progress of all children. Nicky goes home at lunchtime. He's still too young for a full day at school. Nicky is going to live through a period of great changes in his school life. He'll be among the first children to be assessed at seven. And from then on, it's testing all the way. So a good start is more important than ever. There's a free fact sheet for you to go with tonight's program on starting school, and if you'd like a copy, please send a self-addressed envelope at least 12 inches by 9, stamped with a 19-pence stamp to the Education Programme, Programme 2, BBC Education, London W12 7RJ.